sisters, if you turn with me again to uh, Genesis chapter 4, picking up on our series, um, working through the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, up to the story of uh, Cain and Abel, and I'll just read the uh, first 15 verses. Genesis chapter 4. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass. When they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and he killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Thus ends our reading. Let's ask God's blessing on his word. Father, again, having read your holy, infallible, inspired word, a word that we know comes from you. It's truth, but yet at the same time, there is so much here. Lord, we pray that you'd be with my mouth, that you'd guide my heart and mind and bring forth a good word, and that you'd be with everyone here present, that you'd strengthen your people, encourage them, lift up those who are cast down. But Father, we pray too that there is anyone here that does not yet know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We pray, Father, have, have mercy. May their hearts be turned. May they come to a knowledge of their need for salvation in Jesus Christ alone. All these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. The story of Cain and Abel is a pretty epic tale. It's, uh, it's one of those stories that's, that's known by many people and many people outside the church also and, and yet, at the same time, it's a story that's not well understood. Um, it's interesting if you go and, and, and study this, and even in the, uh, even in the Christian tradition, and you, and you study different preachers and teachers and commentators, that there's still a lot of you know, questions swirling around this story. And, and, of course, one of the central questions has to do with um, why did God accept Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's. It doesn't seem fair to us. It's one of those things that in our minds we picture it like God is like the dad. He's, a, he's, he's the head of the family and two of his sons come and they bring a gift and they say, look, dad, you know, and, and, it, and it appears that dad looks at one and says, oh, good job, fantastic, thumbs up. And the other one, he's like, you know, that wasn't that great. That wasn't that great. Right? And, and our minds kind of work that way. We look at that story and we say to ourselves, something's strange here. Well, what's going on? There, there, there's, there's a depth here. And, and it is a deep story, as we'll be seeing over the next few weeks. But, brothers and sisters, one of the things that we see is that it's a continuation. One of the things that you and I have to know about the story of Cain and Abel, it's a continuation. It's a, it's a, it's a consequence. It's, it flows out of the story of Adam and Eve and the fall. The first thing I'd like to do this morning is to show that, to show that, 
that there is a continuation, that this story is intimately connected with the fall. And we're going we're gonna to do just a little bit like a, like a detective would do. Right? If, if you're a detective and you get, call, you get a phone call one morning, one afternoon, one evening, and you get called down to a scene of a crime, there's a dead body here. So, the, so you got to go down and, you, and your investigation begins with the dead body. Our investigation is going to begin with the judgment. We're going to look at the judgment first because the judgment, in, in a way, is, is the easy, easiest to show the connection. The judgment of Cain shows us the connection, um, that there is a connection with Adam and Eve and the fall. Because there are similarities, there are echoes, there are parallels. And we'll look at those very briefly, just to, to, to get this connection in our own minds. First of all, if we look at the judgment of Cain and we look at the judgment of Adam and Eve, the first similarity, and I'm not going in order, is exile. Right? There's an exile. In Adam and Eve, they're exiled from the garden. It says in verse 23 of chapter 3, Therefore the Lord sent him out of the garden to till the ground from which he was taken, so he drove out the man. Now listen to this. In verse 14, Cain says, Surely you have driven me out this day. Right? So Cain himself confesses, God has driven me out this day. So Adam and Eve are driven out of the garden, and Cain says um, that God has driven him out. The second echo, difficulty in farming. In the first story, Adam and Eve, um, Adam is told that the ground is it, it's going to be hard, right? In verse 17, it says, Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. Um, you're going to eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Listen to what he says to Cain. So now you are cursed from the earth, and etc. And then when you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. So farming's going to get even harder. It was hard. It was going to be hard. Um, we see that with Adam and Eve, and, and now with, with Cain, the same thing, except even worse. There's a third echo in the judgment, a third parallel, um, that of hiding from God. In story one, remember that Adam and Eve hid, right? Um, why did, you know, where did you go? Why did you hide? And he says, you know, I saw that I was naked, I was afraid, so I heard your voice in the garden, so I hid. In story two, Cain says in verse 14, I will be hidden from your face. So echo after echo. Here's another one, a fourth echo. And this one you can see in the, in the Hebrew. But the word where, uh, the word where is kind of a funny w word, right? And it's kind of a, well, that's kind of strange. Well, you know, it's a pretty common word. But, but in this first story, when God is looking, he says, where are you? And I told you that in, in, the, in the Hebrew, there's two different words for where. There's apho. And that word means location, right? Whenever the writer uses that word, it means all through the Old Testament, it's saying that, you know, I've been here or, you know, where I've been or where I'm going to, etc. It's a physical location. But when, they, when the Hebrew, when the writer uses the word ayah, when he uses the word ayah, he's not really asking where. It is the word where, but it's not asking where. He's asking why. Why aren't you here? Right? And, and that's what he's asking Adam. Where are you? The question isn't really where is your location. God knows his location. But really he's asking, why aren't you here with me? We have the same thing in the English, by the way, brothers and sisters. You know, if you're uh, going to have lunch with a, a good friend or your spouse, and you're having lunch at 12 o'clock, and it's 1230, and they still haven't arrived, and you pick up the phone or you text them, and what's the question you'll ask a lot of times? Where are you? And you really don't care where they are. What you really are asking is, why aren't you here with me, right? I mean, it's 12.30. You're supposed to be here at 12, right? And, so, and, and that's exactly what's happening. And we see that with Cain also. Where is Abel your brother? Same word, ayah. 
And what he's really asking is, why isn't Abel here with me? So we have these, we have these, these parallel, these, these echoes in the, in the judgment of Cain that go right back to the judgment of Adam and Eve. Exile, difficulty in farming, hiding, where are you? All these parallels show us that these two stories are intimately connected, and if we look and compare the two judgments right up next to each other, what we find is that in the story of Cain and Abel, all the, all the uh, connections are more intense. The judgment of, uh, against Cain, of course, is greater. Adam and Eve are driven from Eden, but settle and find a home not so far from Eden. But Cain won't be able to find a home anywhere on earth. Adam will have, a fight, will have to fight the cursed earth in order to bring forth bread by the sweat of his brow. But in Cain's case, even no matter how hard he works, the ground will not yield its strength to him. It's going to be, it's going to be magnified, expanded. Adam and Eve will hide for a moment. Cain will be hidden for the rest of his life. And of course, Adam is, and with Aya, Adam is temporarily not where he's supposed to be, but Abel is gone for good. And, and so everything is more intense in the second judgment um, than in the first. And, and we see that it's like a ladder, right? That, that it's like an, another rung on the ladder. It's, it's a parallel thing. It's, a, it's the same thing, but it's expanded. Uh, and if the judgment is connected, then the crime is connected. But how? If the judgment is so connected, God's judgment on Adam and on Cain is so connected, then the crime has to be connected. Now, how can that be? Right? Because you think about the crime. In Adam and Eve's case, they ate something they weren't supposed to eat, right? It's kind of like saying to your children, you know, don't eat the cookies, right? Don't go in that cookie jar. And they go ahead and go in that cookie jar. Well, that's one thing. Well, you know, and you tell your sons when you leave, don't fight, and you come back and one of them's dead. That's a huge difference, right? That's, it doesn't seem connected at all. How do, how do we go from taking a cookie to killing your brother? How are those things connected? That's what we'll be looking at in the next couple of weeks. And this week, we'll just begin at the beginning. We'll go back to verse 1 right now. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. And, and, and brothers and sisters, in these first two verses, then she bore again, this time his brother Abel now, and we'll just stop there. In those first verse and a half, there's something very disturbing there. There's a few things that are disturbing, some that we will not look at today. But the names, the names are telling us something. Right away, she bears, right? And, and, and this must have been an amazing thing. And in our Bible study, we talked about it a little bit, you know, the, the idea of the, 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 the womb of the mother, what an amazing thing that is. And here's Eve bringing forth the first human child on earth. And, and what a, by the way, if you, if you study this at all, what you find is that, the, that scientifically they've been able to, uh, you know, put the sperm and the egg together in a test tube, in a, in a scientific um, laboratory, etc. They can actually conceive in a test tube outside the womb. But there's no place on earth that they can grow a baby except in the womb of the mother. It seems like such a simple thing, but it's not. Literally billions of dollars have been invested to try to grow a baby outside of a mother's womb. It cannot be done. To this day, it cannot be done. So there's something amazing and beautiful and powerful when Eve becomes pregnant and now brings forth uh, Cain. She brings forth Cain, and, and it's like there's a, there's a cry of exultation here. Right? I have acquired a man from the Lord. And, 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 and it's like, right? Because think about what God has said. If you eat of this fruit, you shall, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And here's mom looking, we've got a child. And God had said that, that the, the, that the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the, of, of the serpent. I believe, 
And I think that by the time we get done with the series, you'll see that, and I hope agree with me, but I, but I believe that that's what Eve actually thinks. That, that when Cain is born, I have acquired a man from the Lord that's an exaltation because she's looking back at God's judgment and she's thinking to herself, you know what, we, we messed up. Me and Adam messed up and we're outside of the garden and life is harder out here. Our relationship is, is very strained with God. It's not what it once was, but here's this son. This is the seed of the woman that's going to crush the head of the serpent. This is the one that's going to bring us back into relationship. This is the one that is going to reconcile us with God. I believe that's what's on her heart when she says, I have acquired a man from the Lord. There's some other issues with that statement. We're not going to look at that today. But that's what the name Cain is all about. I have acquired a man from the Lord. And there's a sense of exaltation. There's a sense that, whoo, that was bad. Our relationship with God wasn't good for a while. It's going to be better now. But then something strange happens. She bore again. And I don't know how many of you have heard this or not heard it. This is the only place in the scriptures where a woman conceives once and bears two children. That it doesn't say they're twins. Are Cain and Abel twins? Personally, I think so. I think it explains several things that we see as we, as we travel through Genesis and the, and, and the stories that are given to us in Genesis. I think it actually makes a lot of sense. The naysayers will say that, no, 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 they can't be twins because every place where there's twins in the Bible, it says they're, they're twins. On the yay side, like I said, this is the only place where it talks about a woman having a baby where it says she conceived. Every time it says she conceived, she bore a child. If she has another child, she conceives, and then she has another child. This is the only place where it says she conceives once, and she bore again. Is it important? I think it is, but I think the point that's going to be made doesn't depend on that. The key to the next statement, the key to the problem, is the word Abel. His name is Abel. Now notice something about Cain and Abel. Neither one of them is named. They just are. Cain is just Cain. I, I have acquired a man from the Lord. And then it says, and she bore again, Abel, his brother. It, it doesn't say that she named them. It doesn't say that Adam named them. I believe that she did name them. But it doesn't mention that she named them. It just, they are what they are. Kind of a strange thing. But the name Abel is a problem. Abel's not a good name. It's a bad name. And it's really not anything against Abel. But the name Abel in the, in the Hebrew is the word hevel. And it means nothing. Literally. It means nothing or emptiness. It's also translated as vanity. The most famous text, uh, of course, is Ecclesiastes 1 verse 2, where vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And it's the word hevel. And, and what the preacher in, in Ecclesiastes is saying is, is that it's all empty, it's all futile. He's, he's talking about all of life. It's empty, it's futile. So she goes from an exaltation, I have acquired a man from the Lord, and then the second child comes, his name is Hevel. And, and emptiness, nothingness, futility. Um, one of the ways it's also spoken of in the Old Testament is like the breath, you know, a, a man's breath. And so like on a, on a, a little bit of cooler morning, you can see your breath for a second, and then it's gone. That's Hevel. That's his name. How does this woman go from exaltation to hitting the bottom? 
How can she exalt? I have acquired a man from the Lord and all of a sudden go to hevel, nothing, emptiness. And I believe, brothers and sisters, that these two names reflect a word that God gave her. When the first child came, she believed for a moment that the breach between them and God was over. She believed that the curse, this is the answer to the curse, that he's going to undo the curse. But when the second son came, she was reminded of the rest of God's words. I will put enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman. I believe that that woman realized when she gave birth to these two boys, whether it was right away or whether it was another pregnancy, I, like I said, I choose and believe that it's, it's one. That Abel came, the second son came, and God put it on her heart and in her heart, and she saw something terrible. She saw that there was going to be enmity between these two sons, the same way that Rebekah saw it with Esau and Jacob. There's two nations that are warring. She saw that there's going to be the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, that somehow there's just going to be conflict and strife, and she saw it in these two sons. She saw it. God gave her an insight and an understanding. And and think about it as a woman. Think about it as a mother. You don't know which one's which. And in a way, it doesn't matter. Don't you love them both? Don't you see that there's a war and and she sees the war and she sees God's prophecy and that that, um, in pain and sorrow, you're going to bring forth children? And all of a sudden, she sees between these two sons, she has a sense, she has an inkling, she has a prophetic moment, and she sees that this weight of reconciliation, it may come, and the promise of God is sure, but when is it going to come? It's not going to come easy, and it's not going to come soon. It's going to come hard, and it's going to involve pain and strife and agony. I believe with all my heart that Eve, in some way, would have understood 100% what Simeon said so many years later in the temple, listen to what, it said, what Simeon said when Jesus was brought to the temple to, um, to be consecrated, to, to present him to the Lord shortly after his birth. Simeon, that just and devout, righteous man who was literally near death, but he had been waiting all his life to see the Christ. And God revealed him on that day when Jesus came. And he says, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples. And then he goes on to speak about the salvation of God that is coming in Christ. And then he says this, behold, this child is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Right? Now we feel the the enmity there, that this Christ, the, the Savior of Israel, the Savior of mankind that he's going to come, but he's not going to be received universally. He's going to be hated. There's going to be enmity. And then he says this. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. That's what he said to Mary. This son of righteousness, this son of salvation, this this child without sin who will grow up without sin, the only human being ever to, to, to do that. Yet, there's going to be pain. And I believe Eve knew that. Somehow, when Abel came, she named him Hevel. Nothing, vanity, futility. She was talking about life apart from God. 
and what so many people experience, right? Because in a way, the two things, I have, I, have, uh, I have acquired a man from God. If you think about in your youth, you're strong, there's, the world is filled with hope, and, and you've got all your, all your dreams ahead of you, and then somehow you hit middle age, and you get a little older, and you look back, and you're like, you know, what have I done? All of it is ex- expressed in these two names. I thought about a lot, a lot about what to preach on for... Uh, for Ayla's baptism. And I thought, this is a pretty down message. You know, I, you know, it'd be nice to have maybe a better message, but brothers and sisters, the more I thought about it and prayed about it, the more I thought, this is exactly the message you need to hear. If you notice in your, in your, uh, in your uh, bulletin, I had Psalm 94 and I had verses one, two, and four. Verse three starts out, says, I am evil, born in sin. That's a harsh statement, isn't it? I am evil, born in sin, right? It's something that we don't want to say. We confess it, we profess it, we say that we believe it. But how many parents look at their children and say, my my child is evil, born in sin? Now I'm going to tell you something. Think about this. We see it in our neighbor's children. They are evil, born in sin. But we don't see it on our own. I, I think it's kind of funny in a way, but there's truth that if we look at that, we should be able to see that truth. No, it's not just my neighbor's children, and it's not just me. My sons and daughters are evil, born in sin. The story of Cain and Abel, the story of Eve, and bringing forth these children, and the way that she names them, tells us something about the reality, the dark, dark reality of the fall. That every human being from that point, from the point that, you know, the, the song number 94 comes from Psalm 51, where David comes to that amazing uh, acknowledgement Behold! I was conceived in iniquity. In sin, my mother brought me forth. He didn't know that. He didn't get it. He didn't understand how deep it really is in us. Somehow in Eve, when she had that second child, that second boy, it all flashed in front of her. God gave her an an idea of the history of the world going forward. That because of our relationship, our broken relationship with God, that the curse is in each one of us when we're born. And I'm telling you something right now. I know it's a bummer of a message in some ways, but I can't think of a better message that a mom and a dad should hear. You know what? I love my children, and I do look at them through eyes of love. I do look at them through rose-colored glasses. But I want them to be born again. I want them to be born again. I want my grandchildren to be born again. I want my brothers and sisters in the faith, I want to see their children born again. I want them to see and know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And the only way that's going to happen is if us as parents, first of all, take seriously our job to bring up our sinful children in the way that they should go and that we are passionately praying for them. Because nobody can save our children except for God himself. And God has given us amazing promises. But he also calls us to obey him. To bring up our children in the the way that they should go. They belong to him. They're his children. Let's be faithful to do what he calls us to do. Believing and knowing that what Eve experienced when she named Abel is not a fallacy. It's not wrong. It's the truth. Look around in the world today. Look at the pain that's out there already and look at the pain that's coming. 
those children and those young people in the colleges and stuff that are trying to overthrow our own country, our children that were born just like our children. And they were loved just like our children. But they're out there shaking their fist against God, shaking their fist against all authority, shaking their fist at all logical, even good sense. Why? Because they're evil, born in sin. And they need to be born again. Just like our children. Brothers and sisters, Jesus, the eternal, righteous Son of God, came in this world and he became hevel for us. Hevel actually points to Jesus. Jesus became hevel. He became nothing. He emptied himself out, the word of God tells us. He emptied himself so that you and I might be reconciled to God. He emptied himself. He became nothing so that we who are evil, born in sin, could enter into the presence of our holy and blessed Father. A Father who loves us with all his heart. A Father who loves us infinitely. Yes, it's a hard message. But it's the only message that makes Jesus Christ shine. Makes him shine, brothers and sisters, as the one and only that we can hang on to and never let go. The only one that can save our sons and daughters. The only one that can make it assured that we see one another in eternity. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven,